welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, we have a number of three-letter abbreviations for you. We have NVQ, we have the NGO's DSC1, that's a DMQ sponsored by JCB with this lot. We have UTD, that's up the duff. We're not talking about Princess Kate. You've probably noticed that England's finest gun dog, my Cocker Spaniel Muffin, has not been on the show recently. She's been having puppies. I talk you through what it's like to be an anxious dad. But first, CKP, Crowman kills pigeons. The straw bales are a sight for sore eyes. Firstly, because they create a great foundation for building a pigeon hide. Secondly, it means the crops are finally off. Ideal for spotting and picking up those fallen birds. We do have Nancy in attendance and she's already doing a sterling job when we show up. As usual, Andy has made every effort to give us a sporting chance of a decent bag. All the surrounding fields have been ploughed in except this one, which concentrates the number of woodies. The only thing that could put a spanner in the works is a neighbouring farm which has planted rape. I've been feeding on a rape stubble next door. Um, I was hoping someone was going to go there today, it's not my land. Um, I think that's where a lot of these pigeons have gone. They prefer rape over wheat. Most of the wheat stubbles are ploughed up around here now. The only one that isn't is this one and a couple more that we've got. There's no feed for them there anyway, but there's a bit of feed from this on this one. A little bit of corn's gone out the back of the combine on the bank here. It's quite a steep slope. Um, that's the reason the pigeons are here. We know this part of Andy's farm well. Dom shot a brace of fallow bucks from this high seat just a couple of weeks ago. He's also sharing Andy's hide today. Between Field Sports Channel and Sporting Shooter magazine, we probably make Crowman's life pretty difficult. But he's being diplomatic. Hungry, is it true that having to accommodate uh, various members of the press uh, has uh, reduced the number of pigeons you shoot? Uh, <laughs> I do like to blame things when I have bad days and that, but I can't really blame you boys. Who's worse, the, the TV or the uh, the print press for interference? Uh, I can't really answer that one. As yet, the birds aren't flying particularly well, but Crowman thinks that they'll start coming in properly at around three in the afternoon. During the calm before the storm, we can ask him a few questions, such as, what's his best ever year for pigeons? 2002, that was, that was my best year. I'd left where I used to work, doing long hours, and started a job on a stud farm, just doing maintenance and chauffeuring and that, and I was getting a lot of time off. I was finishing early, having early finishes, and. I was shooting a lot of pigeons on one of the farms I used to farm up at Guildford. They had peas up there, uh, spring rape, which are all good crops. That's just that summer I shot about four and a half, nearly five thousand pigeons, so and that was just over the summer months. That's without what I'd shot through the winter as well. That's a lot of birds and dedication. 2011 has been pretty good for Andy, but he hasn't had as much time to allocate to pest control. To help him out with his pigeon problem, Andy has been sent to Winchester SX3 to have a play with. He likes the gun, but it needs a bit of tweaking to get it right for him. The trigger, trigger pull, I did say to Browning when I had a look at one up at the show, I said I needed the trigger pull um, lightened. I think the best thing to do is I'll give it back to Browning and let him sort the trigger out and we're going from there, I think. I'm trying to shoot a few a bit quick, make a better pattern out there. Um, so that the pigeons are a bit more committed, so I can take a bit more time and, and uh, have a few more shots with it. Andy swaps between the SX3 and his usual semi-auto, and we swap to another hide. Andy says he has built it to help get some more shots it's probably so he can have some peace and quiet. We know the pattern is working as we get pigeons drifting in, but the wrong flavour. Then at half past two, on cue, the woodies start showing an interest and Andy gets into his flow. And the birds start crashing around us.
One bird that isn't disturbed by the shots is the pheasant. With the game season underway, what does a man who shoots pigeons think of driven birds? Uh, pheasants fly on a straight line, don't they? I've said it before, they, they fly from one place to another, they fly on a straight line. Once you've got on them, there's no excuse for missing them, really. But pigeons, you have the first shot and you never know where the second shot's going to be because they can go anyway. I just want to be greeted here. Got it. There's three coming, I thought I'd try and let them come and ended up only getting one. Um, it's the only problem when it's windy like this is they've only got to turn their wing just the slightest bit and they're gone. So. No wonder you don't like pheasants. Get back, get That's why I don't like pheasants. Get back, get back, get back. I probably wouldn't be able to hit them anyway. Crowman eventually gets 137 pigeons. If they were pheasants, he would have spent £4,000. He is quids in. Thank you, Crowman. Now it's over to my colleague David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Britain News. When the Duke of Buccleuch donated unmanaged moorland for an experiment on grouse populations, it led to a collapse of grouse stocks. Now organisations including the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust and the RSPB are studying hen harrier breeding and feeding, but alongside a 70% reduction in the fox population. The latest data shows grouse numbers increased in the first two years, but that increase has now stalled. For more information, visit www.langhamproject.com. More school leavers than ever before are going into gamekeeping, according to colleges across the country. It may not be the best paid job in the world, but for quality of life, the students think it's unbeatable. The shooting organisations are fighting back against the proposed devolution of air gun laws to Scotland. The Earl of Shrewsbury is making a case against it in the House of Lords. The new law would give the Scottish Parliament the power to create its own firearms law for low-powered air guns. The mood in Scotland is anti-air gun, and air gunners expect a ban to follow. Animal rights group PETA say free the suspected man-eating saltwater crocodile of the Philippines. The 20-foot animal is suspected of eating a woman, so why does PETA want the animal freed? Well, in case they say it attacks a zookeeper at the wildlife park where it's being kept. And finally, we can announce the winner of the SENS ProFlex Digital Ear Protection Competition. Nearly a thousand of you sent in an entry giving us the correct answer as teal. Well earlier, Charlie picked the winner out of a hat and we're pleased to announce that Gary Gibb from Dunfermline will soon be getting fitted for his new pair of Sens ProFlex worth £600. You're now up to date with Field Sports Britain News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Next, the National Vocational Qualification Level 1 in animal care and health and safety. It's backed by the Countryside Alliance and it's for hunts. William Parker, 17 years old, is second whipper in at the Kimblewick Hunt. His hunt country covers parts of Bedfordshire, Berkshire, Buckinghamshire, Hampshire, Hertfordshire and Oxfordshire. He is one of the new breed of hunt staff who are joining the mainstream of education. The government offers a range of qualifications called NVQs, which stand for National Vocational Qualifications. It means William will learn practical, work-related tasks designed to help develop the skills and knowledge to do a job effectively. Now you may ask, what does the government know about keeping hounds, riding horses and skinning stinkers? Well, the Masters of Foxhounds Association and Wiltshire-based Haddon Training have tailored an NVQ course in animal care which is relevant to hunting. It's done by other, other people working in the, in the animal industry, it's people working in zoos, grooming parlours, so it's a generic animal care NVQ, but we've tailored our course specifically for hunt learners who are working in hunt kennels. One of the modules on the course is one day on basic first aid, and we join William at Oaksey House in Lambourne, where it's taking place. William has been working at the Kimblewick since August 2010 and admits he has not come across a need for first aid yet. You've had fallers, but then it's, it's not my responsibility in the nicest possible way. <laughs> I, I've been more worried about the hounds and what they're doing rather than the subscribers and what they're doing. 
of it, we're about to go and do a bandaging up and that sort of wound dressing will probably be more relevant for, you know, there's always an accident in the flesh house or something like that. That's the more likely to happen rather than my huntsman stops breathing. So, <laughs> so far, huntsman's showing no sign of stopping breathing. No, he's fit and healthy. <laughs> So hunt staff are taking a course also done by people who work in grooming parlours for pampered pooches and as zookeepers. Do they fit comfortably into this group? Well, we feel very comfortably and we're, we're thrilled a bit to have this partnership with Haddon Training, um, between the MFH and, and Haddon Training, be, to allow the boys in hunt service and the girls that we now have in hunt service to leave with a qualification which is transferable, it has transferable skills to other areas in, in animal industries. So in, in the future if the, you know, the youngsters leave hunting they've got uh, employment or a prospect of employment elsewhere. It gives them basic skills like first aid, uh, they do key skills, some English, some mathematics, um, all wonderful life skills that they need for, for future employment in any sphere. Uh, we're also able to give them the theoretical side on, a cor on the course of uh, operating in hunt kennels um, and we can then, we, we're then going to actually assess them practically to ensure that they're, they're safe um, in their environment and that they have the skills to move on and pro provide us with the huntsman, the first we're present and huntsman of the future. William believes the NVQ will help him towards his dream. In ten years time, where, where would you like to be? Ten years time, ooh, <laughs> somewhere nice. Uh, a, a nice pack, um, either sort of, I prefer to be a first whipper in of course in 10 years time, but uh, <laughs> something like that would be sort of perfect, I just, you know, it's what I've been training to do for all these past months and what I've decided to do for my entire life now more or less, I've signed up for a, a long time, so I want to get on and learn them as much as I can. Now, the deer stalking certificate level one, there are lots of ways of cheating it. But where were the National Gamekeepers Organisation learning how to do it properly? Like all good DSC1 training, the National Gamekeepers Organisation runs four day courses, usually over two weekends. The guys here today have a lot to learn about the theory of deer stalking. Why are they nervous? Most of them haven't sat an exam for decades. And this is the Crunch Weekend, the final test. And you've both been swatting hard for this one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what, 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 have you, what have you concentrated on? What, what, where do you reckon you'll, you need to work the hardest for uh, revision? Well, it's just a broad gamut, really. Just take everything. You can't isolate individual bits, I think, and focus on that. You're, you're going to trip over, so I'm just... It's just, I, I, I would reckon it was seasons. The, you know, it's uh, when you're going, you actually know what you're going for and you know what you're going to shoot. So, you know, you book your holiday and you're going to shoot a stag so you know you book your holiday in the stag season. There are five parts to the DSC1 gun safety, rifle accuracy, deer habits and the law, a quarry identification test and questions about meat hygiene. The first two are practical tests. The guys are tested on the last three in a written paper of 120 multiple choice questions. So how good are you? The written questions all come from a bank of 284 of them. Here are three for you to sample. What is the legal open season for row does in Scotland? Is it 21st of October to 15th of February, 1st of November to 31st of March, 1st of November to the 15th of February, or the 21st of October to the 31st of March? Before you climb into a high seat, what should you do? Ensure that the rifle is loaded in case you see a deer as you climb the ladder? Cut some branches to improve your concealment as you climb? Check the ladder and seat for damage and unload your rifle before climbing into the seat? Or rest the loaded rifle against the base of the seat and pull it up on a cord when you are safely seated? Who owns wild deer while they are alive? The owner of the land on which they are found? The government? The holder of the stalking rights over land on which they are found? Or no one? And the answers? Well, the Scottish rodeo season is 21st of October to 31st of March. At the bottom of a high seat, you check the ladder and seat for damage and unload your rifle. And live deer are owned by no one. 
Alan Barrell is the NGO officer holding the course sure today. The course is designed so that people get an understanding of the subjects. That's what we want. We want them to demonstrate that they've got um, the knowledge to go out and start stalking, that they are um, safe to stalk. That'll come from the safety test, which we're going to, or the, the safety uh, examination, which we're going to do tomorrow, and that they have an ability with a rifle to put shots where they need to be. Um, if they go away with that and with the understanding, I'll be very pleased. The course and the exam is being held at Calton Moor Range in Derbyshire, which is run by Mike Dickinson. The DSE Level 1 consists of a shooting test, a safety test, a visual test and a written test. Written test being 50 multiple choice questions, A, B, C and D, and you take the answer. Now, couldn't I just learn that? Couldn't I just go, go out and learn yep, all 50? They're taken from a bank of 280 five questions that DMQ have put together um, so the candidates need to know a broad spectrum of everything about all the species of deer, the law, basic ballistics, um, meat hygiene laws, seasons, um, legal calibres, legal quarry, um, a general no overall deer knowledge. The two practical tests are instant fails if you get them wrong. The safety test is a walk with an examiner who will ask you whether certain shots are safe or unsafe. In the shooting test, you have to put a total of nine shots into the killing area of a deer okay, target at distances from 100 to 40 yards and from various positions including prone, standing and sitting. The really tricky bit for most people is the new part of the test, game meat hygiene. Today, the students have a rare chance to visit a truly Rolls-Royce game handling facility on a nearby private estate. Food hygiene is, these days, the most important part of it. Yeah. Where, where do people typically fall down in the, in the exam? Not realising how easy it is to contaminate a carcass. If you burst a rumen, um, or you get it covered in mud, you, you, from the second it's shot, it becomes a food product, and it wants treating the same as. So, you wouldn't get your sandwiches for your dinner and drag them along through the cow pats and cover them in offal and so yeah treat it as a food product and keep it as clean as possible. There's also a lot of words to learn with food hygiene like maxillary and hassop and rumen. Mm, yep. Um, do people fall down on those at all? Uh, they do a bit. You don't need to know the exact wordings for all the, the glands as long as you can show them where they are you've shown knowledge that you, look, you know what you're looking for. There are lots of ways of passing your DSC1, but unless you are an actor who is good at learning lines, understanding the subject is key. Now here's another quick quiz taken from more DSC1 written questions. Which male antlered deer usually cast their antlers first? Is it kids, old animals, perukes or yearlings? What's the maximum temperature that large game can be stored? Is it 3 degrees, 5 degrees, 7 degrees or 9 degrees centigrade? What is the minimum legal calibre for a roe deer rifle in England and Wales? Is it 222, 243, 240 or 270? The answers are old animals usually cast their antlers first, wild game should be chilled to 7 degrees centigrade and roe deer require a minimum calibre of 0 0.240 inches. If you want to know more about the NGO's courses visit www.nationalgamekeepers.org.uk and if you'd like to know more about the JCB Workmax go to www.jcb.com Next up, I'm going to tell you how to have puppies. Frankly, it's agonising. Far harder than approving a boyfriend for your daughter. I'm talking about finding a dog for your bitch. My Cocker Spaniel Muffin was due to come into season in June. She is four years old and it is time for puppies. The dog I eventually chose is this fine-looking fellow, Archie, owned by shooting writers and engaged couple Simon Barr and Selena Masson. Well, we need to come up with a shortened name for them, like Brangelina, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> I've got Muffji, I don't know. Muffji? <laughs> Sounds terrible. Awful. Uh, now, you're not by any means professional um, stud doggers, are you? Which <laughs> has kind of weird connotations in itself. Uh, you're, but, but, uh, but you have done this before, haven't you? And you are actually, although not by Archie, you're cutting a very pregnant damsel. Yes, damsel is due in 17 days now. 
So we took her to a professional stud um, because we wanted uh, to have a golden sire so we could have a golden uh, puppy. Um, so Well our first litter with her was last year and she was covered by a black sire and the little golden darling gave us seven black boys um, and everybody had asked for golden bitches so um, we thought we would try and increase the chance of getting some golden bitches by using a golden sire this time. Um, so we're by no means professional, we're very very keen gun dog trainers and uh, on, a, on a completely amateur basis for our own enjoyment um, and uh, we had a huge amount of enjoyment out of having a litter of puppies so we thought we'd do it again. It was a real sort of crash course in learning how to um, bring up a litter wasn't it mm. but it, it's it's fairly straightforward and everybody knows lots about it so there's massive amounts of resource out there for you to be able to tap into friends and other people that have done it before so um, it's uh, it was very enjoyable and we're looking mm. forward to her puppies coming along aren't we. Mating was anything but straightforward. Muffin refused to have much to do with Archie. He had to come back and stay with me in Somerset. Professional stud dog handlers are much better at this. Then, suddenly, it worked. They tied. I am behaving like a wet nance about this whole whelping thing. Happily, my old friend Harvey Carruthers, the Shooting Times vet, is on hand to calm me down. Well, there's a few things you ought to do beforehand. So, she should be worm. Um, you should already have made sure she's vaccinated. Does worming possibly affect the puppies? Yeah, well the, the puppies in the womb can pick up worms. A gamekeeper said get a clipped, otherwise this great tuft of winter stuff will get in the way of the birth, is that true? I, no, I don't think that's true. Okay. Um, I think most, most bitches will whelp by themselves without any assistance at all. Um, it's usually, there's lots of blood and goo and but really, it's not going to get tangled up in her hair. You don't need to clip her. Uh. Right, OK. Um, and um, I, I got a phone call from the owner of Archie, who has a bitch, uh, which whelped yesterday. Um, they bought it a, a box to whelp in, and uh, it whelped on their bed. They, <laughs> they were less than delighted. <laughs> yeah, I would keep all the cupboard doors shut and all those little alcoves, those dark areas that you really don't want her producing wet, sticky, mucky <laughs> puppies um, and do your best to direct her to the box. Yeah. As the day approaches I take the advice of Simon and Selena's gamekeeper, always listen to a gamekeeper and bring Muffin to the barber. Um, normally very earlier on in the pregnancy, not three days before, <laughs> but um, yeah, when it varies people get it done just to their pets to look nice every eight weeks, but it's just more practical when the dog's pregnant to have it all off really especially while they're feeding while they're younger. Maybe it was the vibrations of the clippers, but that afternoon, Muffin starts to whelp. The first puppy comes out under a vine in the yard. I call the local 15-year-old veterinary student, Pip White, to come and help. Pip proves her worth by leading Muffin back to the whelping box and by rubbing puppies that look a little lifeless and clearing the mucus from their mouths so they can start breathing. So it is a very fine... Uh, whelping box as you can see but it's quite a big one it was uh, designed for a flat coat retriever but borrowed it off a friend who made it so i'm going to improve it we think um, now she's started giving birth it's time to put up some pig rails so that if the puppies get pushed to the side then uh, she won't crush them like every birth it's a magical experience and at the end of it four survivors three dogs and a bitch just one stillborn and muffin proves to be a good mother now we've had them for a couple of weeks. They're all going to working homes, have been docked, duke lord, chipped and will be kennel club registered. We're keeping the little bitch called Minor and you will doubtless see her on future episodes of Field Sports Britain. The process has been noisy, smelly, exhausting, but worth it. Don't be afraid. You should do it too. Well, we are back next week. This has been Field Sports Britain. And, as usual, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button, which is somewhere around there, or go to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, scroll down and put your email address into the constant contact form box that's shaped like that, or click to like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter, and you will receive news of our programme every week!